Well, I hope, my prayer is when you come to church, that you realize that preaching and teaching, it's, it's not a spectator sport. It's not that you come and I entertain you. It's, I want you to be engaged with me. I want your heart to be prepared to hear the Word of God. Um, and I know that that's the way God will do, do a work. We're going to talk about the spiritual work that He does today. <clears throat> when I decided to do two books of the Bible, I couldn't decide between John or Romans. So I decided I'm just going to do them both. But I had doubts. Uh, you're doing the right thing. Maybe you should just go one book at a time like every other normal person does. <laughs> But I tell you, now that we've been doing it, I really see the hand of God working using both books. Um, last week, Michael talked about our people born good. And we looked at the scripture and clearly saw, no, there is no one good, no one righteous, not one. There is no one that searches for God. And Michael said, that's why God has to seek after you. And, but today, uh, uh, we're going to talk about you must be born again. So it totally goes with it. Because you're not born good, you have to be born again. It is a work that God does. It's not a work you do. My my parents got married in 1960, many moons ago, and uh, I was born in 1963, January 16th, 1963. Thanks for all the birthday wishes on Facebook. I appreciate that. Um, but of course, I think it would be silly for me to say I had something to do with my physical birth. I didn't read a book, How to Be Born of Argo. I, I, I didn't exist. So... It was a work. I understand, I'm 60 now, I understand the science of how it works and, and how a baby is born. But we also know that God's sovereign hand is in it because Scripture says that He knits us together in our mother's womb. So it is a work of God, God using the human element for His purposes. Uh, I want to say to you, I had nothing to do with my physical birth, and I had nothing to do with my spiritual birth, because I couldn't do it on my own. God had to do the work in me, and that's what we're going to see today. And I, want to, I wanted to say this to you. Um, I've been studying the Bible for over 40 years, dissecting the Bible, and whenever you come to this theology of God's sovereignty and man's free will or man's free choices, it can be confusing because you're like, which is it? We know scripture tells us God is sovereign over everything. And that can be confusing, but what about, we're not robots, what about our free will? Somehow in God's mind, those two things work side by side. God's not confused by it. We just have to accept it by faith. Um, if, if everything's God's will and nothing can happen without God's will, what about, what about when there's evil done in the world? What about when Christians do wrong things? Is that God's will then? Well, God allows it. God allows evil for His purposes. God allows us to make mistakes at times and lets us get into trouble so he can do a, 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 even a greater work on our heart or life. We never know what God's up to. I'm just trying to tell you, these things are in God's mind. And if you try to figure it out, you can't. So you're just going to be frustrated. You just have to accept it by faith. So we're going to see here salvation is clearly a work of God that God does. It's not a formula. It's not a prayer that you pray. There's nothing religious you can do. There's nothing good you can do as a human being to earn your way to God. 
It is a work of our sovereign God. So let's look at the Scriptures today. I'm going to break it down in three, just make three points. Uh, Number one, let's look at the sinner's worry. The sinner's worry, this sinner that comes to Jesus. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So we've got to talk about that right now. Uh, this Nicodemus, he was the highest religious person in the land of Israel. He was a Pharisee. He was an expert in the Jewish law. These Pharisees, Jesus often exposed their self-righteousness, and they loved to practice righteousness in the street, so everybody would think they're real spiritual, and they brought attention to themselves. They were very wealthy. They, they had a lot of authority. We know that Nicodemus in John 7 tells us he was a, rem- he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That was the Jewish supreme court in this day. So he's got all the schooling. He's got all the education. His name Nicodemus in the Greek means, means victory over the people. His, his, his parents gave him a successful name. And man, he was a success when it came to religion and wealth and all these other things. The closest thing I could think of in our modern day, this would be like the Pope. The Pope and the Catholic Church coming to talk to Jesus about salvation. I think, it doesn't say here, but I think Nicodemus is empty. I think Nicodemus is guilty because this is what religion will do to you. It'll make you empty. It'll make you guilty. You can never do enough. You don't have peace in your heart. You don't have peace with God because there is no relationship to God because all your religion is on the outside. But he came to the right person that could give him the answer on how to be in the kingdom of God. Verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He comes at night. Um, Probably came at night because crowds of people were flocking to Jesus. If he went at night, these ancient people, there were no street lights, no electricity. They would go home at dark. So if he went at night, he would probably get a chance to talk with Jesus. Some people think he might have came at night because he was worried about what the other Pharisees would think about him talking to Jesus. So, but he says to Jesus, he calls him rabbi. That's a term of respect. Here's the highest religious guy in the land saying, calling Jesus rabbi. And he says, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He believes Jesus is from God, but that's not good enough. That's not good enough. He he has to believe that Jesus is God. He has to believe that Jesus is, is the only way for him to be saved, not his religious works. Um, the transition to this story of Nicodemus, I want to read it again in John 2. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, John, throughout the entire book, is telling us Jesus is God. And right there without saying it, he's saying Jesus is omniscient. He knows what the people are thinking. He knows what's in their heart. They believe in a sense with their mind. They're attracted to the miracles. They're attracted for what Jesus might do for them. 
But Jesus knew in their heart they didn't want to surrender to him and love him and surrender their life to him. You know, what, do you, what would you think about a relationship if a, if a man said to his girlfriend, hey, I'm attracted to you, and I like all the good stuff you do for me, but you know what? I ain't never going to marry you. I ain't never going to be committed to you. I'm never going to be faithful to you. Well, how long would that relationship work? That's, that's what this is. They, in their hearts, they're not going to be committed to Jesus and surrender to Jesus. They're attracted. They want to see the show. They want to see what, what can he do for us. And so Jesus did not entrust himself to them. So now let's look at, and, and this is what was in Nicodemus. He was attracted, but he wasn't really to surrender his heart, so it wasn't good enough. So what's what Jesus tells him? Let's notice number two, the Savior's word. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Hmm. Uh, Nicodemus doesn't ask a question. He just makes a confession. You're a teacher from God. Why does Jesus answer him? Because Jesus knows what he's thinking. He knows he's wanting to know about the kingdom. He's wanting to know, is there something? I, I thought I've done everything religious enough to get to, get to God. Is there something else I got to do? But Jesus says, truly, truly, and he would often say this. In other words, I'm telling you the truth most assuredly that unless a person is born again, they will not see the kingdom of God. They will not be in heaven. Wow. You know, I've heard, I heard, I've heard people say over the years, uh, I'm a Christian but I'm not one of those born-again ones. <laughs> well, you're in trouble then. Because <laughs> Jesus says, unless you're born again, and I know, I know there's been a lot of people claiming to be born-again Christians, they do crazy stuff. And it gives the, it give, it gives the born-again thing a bad name. But this is the truth of the Word of God. The born-again, uh, in the Greek, Anothen, anothen. It is. It means to be born from above. So unless you're born from above, unless heaven comes down and touches you and supernaturally save you, you cannot go to heaven. There is nothing religious you can do. There is nothing. There is nothing uh, human you can do to earn your way to God. That is the point of this. Um, when he says the kingdom of God, he's talking about when you become a believer, you're part of God's kingdom. Jesus talked about the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. So you can't be a part of God's kingdom without being born again, and you will not see his physical kingdom on a new heaven and a new earth one day unless you are born again spiritually. James 1 says it this way. It says, Every good, good gift and every perfect gift is from above. There's our Greek word, ano, anothen. Coming down from the Father of, of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So, it's saying God, God is a perfect gift giver. God wants to come down and give you eternal life. Any good gift you have, including your salvation, God does it. It's a gift from above. That's what he's saying. God is pure light. He doesn't change like people. He doesn't like, you know, if you've been around people, they, depending on their mood, one day they love you and one day they don't love you. God's not like that. He has a perfect love towards you. And he gives perfect gifts and Ephesians 2 makes it clear that 
We are saved by faith alone, not our works so that no one can boast. So it's nothing you do. You have faith that Jesus can save you, and then he does a supernatural work in your life, and you are born from above. You are born again. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says you become a new creation. Now, some of you, sometimes depending on the sermon, I know there was a sermon a couple weeks ago. I, I went off on a tangent about how you know, certain people who call themselves Christians, they say they're Christians, but then they go out on Friday night, they, they talk like the rest of the world, say all kinds of things that, that is not the will of God to say, do all kinds of things, break God's laws, but then they say, well, I'm a Christian, I believe. And that sounds like I'm saying, okay, you can't be a Christian unless you start doing this and unless you stop doing this. That's not what I'm saying when I say these things. What I'm saying is, if you're truly born again and you're a new creation of God, the next verse after it says we're saved by faith, not by works, says you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You're God's masterpiece. God created a work in your heart when you're born again. So therefore, there's no way you can be the same. I, you know, I was born again back in 1981, sitting in the back of a church with a hangover. And... and I heard the gospel, and God just, God touched me that day. I can't even explain it. And I'm telling you, I've never been the same. Doesn't mean I don't struggle with sin. As a human being, I do. Doesn't mean I have never failed. But it means you're going in a new direction. That's all I'm trying to tell you all. You can't, you can't, have a supernatural work of God done in your heart and you not be different. And I think when you're truly born again, I think you have a desire. And that's meant why you're here today. You have a desire to hear the word of God. You have a desire to be with God's people. Uh, I would hope that you don't like your sin, whatever it is. I would hope that when you sin, you don't enjoy it anymore. That you want to confess it that you'd like to ask God to help you overcome it. But this is a work God does. You can't do it on your own. It's something He has to do with you. And I hope, I hope you're with me on that. I hope God, the Holy Spirit, gives you understanding uh, about that. Let's go to verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, he's kind of being a little sarcastic here. This is impossible, Jesus. I can't go back. I can't go back. But Jesus wasn't talking about physical birth. He was talking about spiritual birth. So Jesus explained it to him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly again, I say to you, Unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Nothing you do in the flesh, that's nothing you do as a human, can get you to heaven. The only thing that gets you there is a work that the Spirit does from heaven in your heart. That's what he's saying. Now, now, what is that born of the water and the Spirit? There are so many views on what Jesus is saying here. I don't think it's that hard to figure out. I can tell you right now, it's not talking about baptism. Because ba Jesus didn't even institute baptism until after the resurrection. He's not talking about baptism. Plus, he's making it clear it's not a human work. And that's why I say every time I baptize someone... The water isn't saving you. I can't save you. It's the work God does in your heart. So baptism pictures the work you can't see that God did. You get baptized because 
God has already done a work in your heart, so you want to be obedient to that. That's the fruit of it. But it doesn't save you. So he's not talking about baptism. Some people think he's just given an analogy of physical birth versus spiritual birth. So that someone will say the water is the water in the mother's womb. So unless you're born physically from the water in your mother's womb, that would make you alive. But then you have to be born spiritually again. Now, it sounds like it fits the context here. But the, 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 when you really look at this and you look at the context and you look at who Jesus is talking to, he's talking to an expert in the Old Testament. He's later on going to say in the next sermon, you're the teacher of Israel. Like you're the greatest teacher in Israel and you don't know these things. Jesus' point is, have you not read the Bible? Have you not read the scripture? And, and obviously, Nicodemus had so much scripture memorized. So what would be, what would a scripture say about the water and the spirit? Listen to, listen to Ezekiel. I think Nicodemus had this memorized. It says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to supernaturally change your hard heart and make it soft. And I will put my spirit within you. He's talking about being born again spiritually. And cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Now you're not going to follow the law, Nicodemus, because you're, you're trying to earn your way to heaven. It's going to be on your heart to obey God's law. Because you're going to be a new person. That's what I believe the water and the spirit is. The water is the washing of the word. These are spirit, this is spiritual language. And the spirit is what gives you the new birth and regeneration. You remember when uh, Jesus washed the disciples' feet and he came to Peter and Peter wouldn't let him wash his feet? What did Jesus say to him? He said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Was he talking about the feet? No. He was talking about unless I spiritually wash you, that's the word. Um, it, it calls, in Ephesians 5, talking about marriage, it calls husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church, I mean, be willing to sacrifice for her. And then it says, sanctify her, Help her to be set apart from the world. Rescue her from the world. Sanctify her and wash her with the water of the word, it says. What does that mean? Give your wife a bath while she's reading a Christian book? No. It's talking about getting your wife to church and, and feeding her spiritually and helping her spiritually. And you work together as a team. And... It's, but the, it's that spiritual washing. When you come to church, you're hearing the word of God, it cleanses you. It cleanses you. Jesus told the disciples, you're already clean by the word I have spoken to you. So he's clearly talking to Nicodemus about a spiritual cleansing that comes from the word of God and the spirit of God working together supernaturally on somebody's heart. Listen, listen, hear me, hear me on this. It's not about religion. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, all that religious stuff you do, you, you've done, it's a big fat zero to God. God doesn't care about it. Isaiah says our, our, our righteous acts are like filthy rags to a holy God. If you think you can do righteous acts and earn your way to God's holiness, 
No. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, in Philippians 3, he's talking about all the religious things he did. He talks about he was circumcised on the eighth day. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, an expert in the law. He persecuted the church. He said, I, I kept the law blamelessly, Paul said. But then he says this, I consider that all rubbish, rubbish compared to knowing my Savior, Jesus Christ. All that religious stuff made me empty. But when I came to Christ, he changed my heart. That's what he's saying. So Paul is saying, my religion in the Greek, it's, it's uh, where's, my, where's my word? Scubalon. <laughs> okay, in the Greek, it's scubalon. It's translated rubbish in the ESV. It, what is scubalon? It is animal excrement. Some Bibles say dung. That's what, I, that's what Paul says my religion is. It's meaningless. It's worthless. It's useless. Okay? Uh, some of you are not allowed to say bad words at work. Just if you get mad at somebody, tell them they're full of scuba long. <laughs> All right? But if, you're, if your boss speaks Greek, you're going to get fired because you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so it's worthless. I ask you today, what are you trusting in? What, what you know, in an old evangelism class, they used to, we used to ask people, they taught us to ask people, when you die and stand before God and God says, why should I let you in? What will you say? I, I ask people these questions all the time. They say, well, I'm a good person. I try to obey the Ten Commandments. I, I, I go to church sometimes. It's all about what they do and they don't understand. None of that can save them. It's too late. Your sin has separated you from God. So the only thing you can trust in is God doing the work in you. The supernatural work that he does. You hear the gospel. I heard the gospel. Gospel means good news. I heard Jesus died for my sins. He loved me. And even though I'm a sinner, he died for me. And that if I put my faith in him, he would save a wretched sinner like me. And that is the only thing that can save you. And when you do that, when you do that, that's when God brings about that transformation in your heart. Thirdly and finally, let's look at the spiritual wind. Verses 7 and 8. He says, Do not marvel that I said to you, Don't be shocked, Nicodemus. You must be born again, born from above. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not want to know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. He gives an earthly analogy like wind. You can't see wind. We can see it blowing the trees, but it's invisible. So Jesus is giving him a simple, it's like the wind. It's like God's Spirit is in here. The wind is there. And if, and if it comes and that wind blows on your heart, you can be born again. You can be saved. It's, the, it's a work of God. I love it. And, and so we need to understand it's not about what we do. It's about what God has done for us. That is the point. In our day, we can track where the wind is coming from with our technology. But, you know, man can build windmills but they can't mill without the wind. A man can build sailboats, but they can't sail without the wind. We, we know we can track hurricanes. We're all watching that weather channel when the hurricane was here, right? We could see the wind on the radar, right? But no one can stop it. And you know what? No one can stop a work of God that he wants to do on your heart. No one can. And that's good to know. That's good to know. And it's possible God has you here to do a work on your heart. 
Many of you, many of you, it's already happened. You're already a different person. You're here to grow. Some of you, you're like Nicodemus. You're checking it out. I'm kind of attracted to this. Heaven sounds a lot better than hell, but you haven't really been born again. I think you have to ask God to do the work on your heart. And if you ask God to do the work, that means he's already working on your heart. (laughs) Try to figure that one out. But I want to say one more thing. I'm going to talk about the sinner's prayer. Okay, A lot of times when you, 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 you buy a book, How to Be Born Again, and they give you this, these formulas. Okay, But here's the problem. So many people have done the formula. They prayed the prayer that they tell you to pray if you want to be born again. But they weren't born again. It was an empty prayer. Because a prayer can't save you. Um, so this is why we got to be careful because we got so many people saying, well, I'm a, well, I'm a Christian because back in 1980, I don't go to church anymore, but back in 1980, I, uh, walked down an aisle at the church and some guy made me fill out a card and I prayed a prayer, but there's no change in his heart. He has no love for God. And this is scary. So we got to be careful telling people, all you got to do is pray this prayer When, now, I don't get on a witch hunt about the sinner's prayer like some people, okay? Because I believe sinners pray sometimes. The the tax collector, he goes into the temple, and what does he say? God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That was a sinner's prayer. And Jesus said he went home justified. But here's what you got to understand. It's because Jesus already did a work on his heart. That's why he prayed the prayer. So when I talk to people about salvation... And I will pray with them, but I'll go, hey, this prayer is not going to save you. It's the work God does on your heart because you have faith in him alone. And you don't trust in in anything in yourself. That's how it works, okay? So, just we got to be careful with these terminologies. So again, in closing, I would just say to you today, I ask you, what are you trusting in? Is it some prayer you prayed a long time ago or maybe you got baptized? It's because you've attended church all your life? Are are you trusting in something you have done or you continue to do? Or was there a time in your life when you were born from above, when you truly put your faith in Jesus and you've never been the same? So... I'll say to you right now, so you might be thinking, so Frank, what do I got to do? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing you can do. You just have to embrace it, accept it, respond to it. And so if Jesus has been working on your heart, if he's been drawing you to him, see, that's the human thing. When I, when I got saved, when I was born again, um, my mom invited me and my girlfriend Darla to church. So my, God used my mom. God used my girlfriend. Uh, I went to church with my own free will. But what I know now, after studying the scripture all these years, God was drawing me to that church. It was a work God was already doing on me that, that I couldn't figure out until it happened. So if God's been drawing you, man, quit running from it. Embrace it. Accept it. Let let him regenerate you. Let him give you this beautiful, precious. Let that wind blow on you today. And And become a part of the kingdom of God. Pray with me. Let's pray and we'll close up today. Uh, This story of Nicodemus goes all the way down to verse 15, but uh, there's so much in here. I don't want to rush through it. He says some other amazing things to Nicodemus. And we will talk about what happened to Nicodemus because we believe when we look at Scripture, he, he ended up being born again. One of the few Pharisees. 
that responded to Jesus, most of them hated Jesus because they didn't want to give up their religion. They wanted to remain self-righteous. But in this moment, I'll say it to you again, a prayer can't save you. God does a work on your heart. But I think that prayer, it, it feels good. It feels good to say, God, help me. I mean, we think prayer's got to be fancy. No, God, help me. God, help me. God, God, if this is true, save me. God, let the wind of the Spirit blow on me. I want to change. I want to be all in. I want to surrender. And be sincere about it. And I trust. Because God is merciful and loving and gracious. Jesus said, Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous. I've called the sinners. In other words, people who think they're self-righteous, I didn't come for them because they don't want me. But if someone's a sinner and they know it, that's who I'm saving. Let Jesus save you. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this powerful story, God, of being born again. God, I pray that you would help people. I know that it's hard to grasp. It's hard to understand all of it. I just pray, God, that your, your spirit would help people understand. The main point is there's nothing they can do to earn the kingdom of God. That it's a work you do when they respond by their faith. Give that person the gift of faith. And may they respond. And may we see the future, how they are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Do a work in their life, God. We thank you for all these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.